Okay, so we can start. Let's let, let's have a look now at the first sutta then, which is called One Fine Night. So starting, yeah, that's great. So this is the uh, uh, beginning of this, and uh, the uh, so um, just t you can take it up to the beginning of the sutta uh, lie, and we will just uh, take everything stage. All, all the bits and pieces, yeah. So this is uh, this particular sutta is uh, um, called translated here as one fine night, and the Pali uh, word for this sutta, the Pali name is the Bad Eka Ratta Sutta, and uh, you may have heard of this sutta before. It's also called one fortunate night or one auspicious night, and these kind of things. Badda Badda means auspicious in Pali, and Eka is one, Ratta is night. So it's one auspicious night. And this is a important sutta in the Pali canon. It is important because it occurs four times. Yeah, it is found here, as you can see, MN131 means the middle length sayings of the Buddha, number 131. And so it occurs four times. And when, it, when a sutta occurs so many times in slightly different ways, you know, it is like a core aspect in a sense. Uh, yeah, it's an important aspect of the Buddha's teachings. Uh, and um, uh, what this sutta is about, uh, it is basically about, it's a verse way of thinking about meditation. It's a versified way. And verse is very often used by the Buddha to inspire people to kind of get them on the right track. Uh, verse is not the most powerful, maybe, way of presenting the Dhamma, because if you want to present the Dhamma clearly, verse can be a hindrance, because verse has a certain constrictions to it. So if you want to present the Dhamma in a very clear way, then usually prose is better. But what you will find here is that verse can be very inspiring. And these particular verses that you find here are kind of inspirational way of thinking about meditation practice. The Bad Ekarata Sutta. It also exists in Chinese translation as well. That is always one of the things to look out for, huh? whether these suttas exist in other parts of Buddhism. And if they do, then you know that they are more likely to be original and real uh, suttas as a consequence. So this is a very, uh, for this reason, very foundational and basic idea of thinking about uh, uh, meditation practice. So I will uh, read it out and I will comment on this as I, as I read this out. So, so I have heard at one time the Buddha was staying near Savati in Jeta's grove, Anatta Pindika's monastery. There the Buddha addressed the monastics. Monastics, venerable sir, they replied, the Buddha said this. So here we have the Buddha again, as always, the suttas begin with, thus have I heard. And this reminds us that this is an oral tradition. This comes and has been passed down through generations. And this has been orally delivered from one generation to the next one. And here you find, as you very often do, you find the Buddha staying at Savati. Savati being the great capital of the Kosalan uh, kingdom, the empire, was a very large country in northern India at that time. And because Savati was the capital, it was also the place where they had one of the largest Buddhist monasteries in ancient India. And this monastery is called Anattapindika's monastery. Anattapindika, as you, many of you will know, of course, one of the great donors to Buddhism in ancient India. He started this monastery. And there's a very famous story of Anatta Pindika that you can find in the Vinaya Pitika. And um, maybe one day we can have a look at that story. And then the Buddha speaks to the monks. Yeah, He, say, uh, he says, uh, mendicants. And this is quite interesting the way the Buddha, where sometimes he will give a discourse without being asked any question. Yeah, He would just talk on his own uh, coming from himself. And this is what he is doing here. And then he says, I shall teach you the passage for recitation and the analysis of one fine night. Listen, pay close attention. I will speak. 
And this is the way the Buddha often starts off when he says that he's going to give a teaching. Yeah, he says, listen, pay close attention. I will speak. It's all, almost as if he is getting ready. He's kind of saying, now the Dhamma is going to come. And if the Dhamma is going to come, it is really worthwhile to listen and to pay attention to what is going on here. And we find this in the suttas in so many places. If you are able to really pay attention to what is going on, if you're able to listen to the Dhamma, that is where the inspiration often arises. Yeah? You pay close attention to these words. You allow them to go in deep. You remember them for the future. You draw out the meaning of what often is a very succinct and short expression of the Dhamma. And by doing that, by coming close to the Dhamma in this way, it allows you to practice these teachings very powerfully. powerfully. So the Buddha always reminds the monks, yeah, listen, pay attention. This is important. Your life depends on what I'm going to say here. Yeah, this is kind of fascinating. Your life depends on what, he doesn't actually say this literally, but that is kind of the implied statement. Because our life is really about finding happiness in the world, finding an overcoming of suffering. So if you're going to have a meaningful life, it depends precisely on being able to listen to the Dhamma in this way. So listen, yeah? put aside what you're doing. Don't think about the future. Don't think about the past. Don't fantasize about anything. Just close your eyes. This is why very often we close our eyes when we listen to a Dhamma talk, because when you close your eyes, it's like you're shutting out things of the world. It allows you to take in what is going on. Yeah? It becomes more powerful in that way. It's like a message that is supposed to go to the heart in a deep way, and then it becomes powerful. Listen, pay close attention, I will speak. Yeah? And what he is going to speak on her. He says here, it is the passage for recitation. It is called a, an Udesa in Pali. And then he's going to give the analysis. And the analysis here is called the Vibhanga. Vibhanga, so, and this is a very standard way for the Buddha to present the Dhamma. He gives, first of all, a short passage, yeah, a short kind of summary of the teaching. And then he analyzes the teaching afterwards. He kind of pulls it apart and says, this is actually what it means. And this is a very skillful way of thinking about the Dhamma, because on the one hand, you remember the core passage, and then you remember the commentary, the way to understand it afterwards. So we're going to do the same thing today. We're going to follow the Buddha's Buddha's idea on this, uh, and we're going to look at the short passage, uh, and we're going to analyze it. We're going to analyze it even more detail, because that's the, why I'm here. I'm here to analyze things even more. Uh, otherwise, I would be superfluous. Uh, yeah, wouldn't be any point in having me unless I analyze it a little bit more. So that's why I, I'm here to add a little bit of extra analysis. Uh, of course, my analysis is not not so important. Yeah, it is. Uh, uh, the word of the Buddha is far more important, uh, but to bring out the meaning, it is very, it is useful to uh, go through this uh, process of analysis. So now let us come to the real verses here. Yeah? Yes, sir, the monks replied, uh, and the Buddha said this. Uh, Don't run back to the past. Uh, don't hope for the future. Uh, What's past is left behind. The future has not arrived. And phenomena in the present are clearly seen in every case. Knowing this, foster it, unfaltering, unshakable. Today the day to today's the day to keenly work. Who knows? Tomorrow may bring death. For there is no bargaining to be struck with death and his mighty hordes. The peaceful sage explained, it's those who keenly meditate like this, tireless all night and day, who truly have that one fine night. So that is the verses of the Bhade Karata Sutta, very famous verses. And it is said elsewhere that these verses have to do with the found, very foundation of the spiritual life. 
So these are very fundamental for understanding what the spiritual life is about. Uh, uh, Lai, if we could please go back to the beginning of the verse again, please. Uh, yeah, that's good. Yeah. So uh, the Buddha starts off, and this is a very kind of common theme in Buddhism, yeah? and, and this is where that theme comes from, uh, the idea of giving up the past and giving up the future. Uh, and if you hear any kind of Dhamma talk or you hear any kind of uh, um, uh, instruction for meditation practice, uh, it will often be said that the past and the future, you have to give it up. You can come into the present. Yes, yeah? so this is a very standard thing here. And I remember when I was still starting out in my monastic life and uh, Ajahn Brahm was my teacher. I came to Australia all the way from Norway just to take Ajahn Brahm as my teacher. So I was, felt very sure that that was the right uh, move in a sense. Uh, and Ajahn Brahm had this beautiful idea of the past and the future being like a heavy luggage, luggage that we're always carrying with us. In the right hand, you have a suitcase of the past, and then in your left hand, you have the suitcase of the future, and you carry these with around you as if you're burdened with something. Your mind is heavy because you have all of these things with you. And when you let go of these burdens, yeah, this is what the past and the future are. When you let go of them, the mind feels light. The mind feels kind of uh, um, buoyant. Yeah, it feels easy. And you will have, I'm sure you will have noticed that in your own meditation. Yeah, when finally you're able to let go of the past and the future a little bit, you come to the present and you just sit back and you relax in the present. There's something very delightful about that. And of course, one of the main reasons is because you let go of this great burden of the past and the future. So the question then is, well, if these things are such burdens and we should let go of them, how exactly do we do that? It's easy to say, right? It's very easy to say, let go of the past and the future. There's no point in having them. And then you close your eyes and then the past and the future are there. You, you can't let go of them. If they are so bad, if they are so destructive for meditation practice, why is it the case that we can't let go of these things? What is the problem? And of course, the reason is very simple. The reason why we cannot let go of these things is basically because of attachments. It's because of our interest in that sensory world, because that sensory world somehow uh, gives us a sense that this is what our life is all about. Uh, yeah, our life is about the sensory world. And because our life is about the sensory world, we think about that world, and that world exists to a very large extent in the past and the future. Uh, so what can we do? Uh, and this is where this idea of right view comes in. Yeah? The, the way of thinking about the world in the right way. Uh, and if we think about the world in the right way, then... Uh, Actually, the letting go of these things happens almost as a matter of course. It's like a default thing, yeah? like Ajahn Brahm was saying. The thing is just thrown out. So what is the right way of thinking about this? So let me say, first of all, a little bit about how to avoid thinking about the future. And I have been teaching this recently, and maybe some of you have heard this because I've been talking about this in other places as well. So the way to let go of the future, the way to think about this, uh, and as a source for understanding this, I would, uh, I'm going to, uh, just a very little anecdote that I came across recently. And this is in connection with the war in Ukraine. Uh, it's very useful to think about things that are real. Yeah, The, the war in Ukraine affects all of us. Uh, so it's very handy to kind of think of that, that war a little bit. Uh, and... In this war in Ukraine, um, what we find uh, is that uh, many people are suffering. Yeah? When there is war, people suffer. Uh, that is what you have to expect. Uh, and sometimes you can interview these people. And some of these people were interviewed because they were journalists in Ukraine, risking their life to be able to write stories about what is happening. Yeah? And one of these was a lady, I think. I think it was a young woman or something like that. Or maybe someone was interviewed. I think it was a young, young woman. And she was asked, how do you feel about this war going on? Yeah, what is your reaction to these things? And she was very distraught. She was very upset about this 
war going on in her country. And she was saying, they are destroying my future. My future is being destroyed. Here are these people invading our country, yeah, and bombing us, destroying our families, destroying our homes. Her house had been demolished by some kind of explosion or something. Family members are dying. The local community is being destroyed. Yeah, all the buildings, all the uh, infrastructure that is there, the people who are coming together, uh, everything is being destroyed. Our society isn't working anymore. What's going to happen to me? My future is being destroyed. And the interesting thing is you can see why she is saying that. Yeah, you can understand why. It's a natural reaction. Yeah, my future is being destroyed. You cannot see any way out of this anymore. What is the way out when everything around you is crumbling and people are dying? It's, it's very difficult to deal with. So you can understand what she is talking about. But the interesting thing is that from a Buddhist point of view, she is actually wrong. Her future is not being destroyed because the problem is that she is misunderstanding what, where to actually find the future. The future is not found in the world around us. This is not really how we build our future. Yeah, usually, very often, unfortunately, we think that our future is about where, where the world is heading. Are we able to solve the problems in the world? Are we able to have less wars and less problems, less pandemics, less climate change? Are we able to have more happiness and joy by uh, uh, having a better food supply, getting more sensory pleasures in our life? Uh, and as long as we can control the world to create more of this, yeah, more iPhones, yeah, if, if every can ha everyone can have an iPhone, then we will be really, really happy, right? No, wrong. If everyone has an iPhone, we'd be even more miserable because iPhones just make you miserable. iPhones just cause even more restlessness and all kinds of things, yeah, and there's kind of no end to it. But we think that if we can sort out this world in a certain way, then we will find happiness in the future. But it actually, it is wrong. Yeah? The world outside only contributes a very small part to our happiness. The world outside is not that important. This young lady, once the shock of war has happened, uh, maybe she flees from Ukraine, uh, maybe she goes to another country in Europe, maybe to Germany, which is close by, or Poland or whatever. She reestablishes her life. Uh, maybe she gets an education in a new country. She finds someone she can maybe have a nice family or relationship with. And then the life just carries on in a certain way. Yeah, yeah? like Ajahn Brahm always says, good, bad, who knows? Is this really bad, this war? Well, whether it is bad or not depends on how you relate to it. If you relate to the war in the right way, it may not be so bad. It could even have a positive outcome. And then when you come from the spiritual point of view, from a Buddhist point of view, you realize that my future actually does not depend so much on the world outside. What it really depends on is the world inside, is how I live. If I live well, if I live with kindness, if I live with care, if I live with compassion, if I look at the war in Ukraine and I understand this is the nature of the world, there's so much suffering in the world, compassion is the right attitude to have. We are all stuck in this together. Yeah, there is no way out. It's just the way the world operates. It creates so much suffering all the time. The right approach is to have compassion for these people, to help out, to develop the good qualities within. And if we use our understanding of the world outside, understanding that to actually build up good qualities within, then we are creating our future. Because our future depends on what we build up inside, not so much on what happens outside. Why is that? Well, the reason is because if you build up a sense of happiness inside, actually the world outside becomes kind of irrelevant because you have this uh, reservoir, yeah? you have something that makes you resilient to what happens outside. And the more we build up the inner happy happiness inside, the more resilient we are for what happens outside. The more peace you have, the more compassion you have, 
the more in this very life makes you resilient. So next time there is a problem, you have that inner thing already within you. You can look at the external world, you can see the problems in the external world, and you can say, yes, it is a little bit of suffering, but actually it is only a small part compared to what I experience because I have developed all of these good qualities within myself. And of course, that is only in the short run. But in the long run, when it comes to the idea of rebirth, then those qualities are even more important. Yeah? That is when really the payoff for living well is so enormous. And then you can say all of those wars and those problems I had in my life, actually they are small compared to the outcome, the payback I get from living well and living in the right way. In the long run, what really makes my future is how I live now. And when you understand this, and when you think like this in your meditation practice, it is extraordinarily powerful because it means that you know that it is what I do now in my meditation. If I close my eyes, if I become peaceful, if I have a state of metta in my meditation, that is where I build my future because these good qualities are what create the future in return, both in this life, but even more so in future lives. But all the world outside, that world which I love to think about, actually, that is not really important at all. That is only going to have a very slight, a slight significance for what my life is like in the future. And once you get this right, what, once you start to understand what creates the future, what makes your life really worthwhile and creates happiness, uh, once you get that, it becomes very easy to let go of the world outside and focus on the qualities within uh, because this is where the future is made. So this is the idea of right view. Uh, this is the idea of thinking in the right way, uh, understanding that the future comes not uh, from the external world, but it comes from what we're doing right now. And then you let go of the world. Then you focus on the meditation. Then the metta, the compassion, all of these things become possible. Why? Because you know that is what is important and everything else actually is very much secondary. Okay, so that is getting us just started, warming up a little bit. So I hope you are getting warm now. <laughs> and I was talking about uh, uh, not hoping for the future, because when you stop thinking about the world, the world being your future, and you know that it is how you live now that matters for your future, then when you meditate, uh, you go to the meditation, because that is where you make the future. It is in meditation that you make good karma. It is in meditation that we build up good qualities. It's in meditation that we find a little bit of peace that makes it possible for us to be more kind in our lives because we feel more balanced, we feel more at ease within, and then we also have more time for other people and we have more time for being kind to others around us. So it is a very powerful way of learning how to let go of the world. But let us talk a little bit about the past as well, yeah? because the past is also a problem. Sometimes you can think about yourself, you think that, oh, in the past I was more happy. Yeah? In the past things were so, so good. In the past my life was better than it is now, or now I'm getting old, my body is falling apart. Oh, I wish I was young again. I had more strength in the body. My eyesight was better. And and all of these kind of things, yeah? And uh, you may think about the past in this way. And this is a way of being attached to the past, essentially. Yeah? And many people have this problem where you are attached to the past in a certain, certain way. Yeah? And one of the, um, the ways that we sometimes attach to the past, and I have noticed that with, uh, with people, is that often they have like a photo album. I guess these days we don't have photo albums anymore. But in the old days, people had photo albums and they would flick through the pictures of the past and they think, oh, wow, that, what a wonderful holiday that was. Oh, no, these people have died already. And you see these people who died a long time ago. You were with them on a holiday or whatever. 
And then you feel a sense of almost like regret, a longing for the past. And of course, these photo albums, they always, everyone is always happy. Yeah, when you take a picture of someone, you always say, smile to the people because you want a nice picture. And then you keep it for the future. And then in the future, you look back, you think, oh, the past was so happy. Yeah, everything was so good. And then we forget that those photo albums, they are not telling you the truth. They're only telling you one side of the story. They are telling you the side when everyone is supposed to smile for the picture. The photo albums, the pictures of the past, they are lying to us. It is not the truth. We are buying into this idea that there was something there in the past that actually was much better than it, than it really was. So burn those photo albums. Yeah, get rid of them because they lie to you. They're not telling you the truth. And I think people would be far better off by burning the photo albums and not thinking about the past in this way than holding on to an image of the past that actually is not even remotely true to the reality. So in this way, you start to understand that our idea of the past, even if you don't have a photo album, even if you don't watch the pictures of the past, our idea of the past is always distorted. We always remember the things that we want to remember. We remember the situations that were, especially we tend to remember the situations that are good. Or sometimes we, if we had some trauma in the past, we remember the situations that are bad. But we tend to focus on certain extremes of our experience. And we know it is not really realistic. Yeah, so we need to let go of the past. It is finished. It is over. We don't really know anymore what it was like. The past is just a faint recollection in our mind. It's a memory, and that memory cannot really be trusted. So one of the ways of dealing with the past and also dealing with the future and also dealing with the present is to overcome attachment a little bit more because all of these things are really just attachments in one way or another. We are attached to the past, we hold on to those things, or we have, are attached to the future because we have some idea of what the future is going to be like, or we have attachments right now in the present. We're holding on to whatever it is that we're holding on to right now in the present. Yeah, so, the, so everywhere across the board, attachment is a big problem. So when we let go of attachments in our life, what exactly is it that we are doing? Well, what we are doing is the second factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. This is what Nekama Sankapa is about. Nekapa means to relinquish. Yeah, it means to let go of things. Yeah, Nekama is the opposite of uh, the sensory existence, holding on to things in the world. Uh, so by having the intention of nekam, nekama, the, renun the intention of renunciation, which is like giving up, uh, that is what non-attachment is about. Uh, and people often think that the idea of nekama sankapa, the intention of renunciation, they think it is something very profound. Uh, and it can be very profound, uh, but it can also be quite simple. Uh, the beginning of Nekama Sankapa is just attaching less to the world around us. And as you attach less to the world around you, you're actually doing a little bit of renunciation. Yeah, so that's really all you have to do, learning how to attach a little bit less. And as you do that, then this, uh, this is the beginning of renouncing things of the world. So how can we think about the world in such a way that we can do less attachment? Yeah, sometimes you, you can hear Buddhists say that, oh, I must not be so attached because attachment is against the Buddhist idea. Good Buddhists are not really attached. But as with so many things on the Buddhist path, we need to have a method. We need to have a way of thinking. We need to have the right view yeah, to be able to let go. Because if you just say, I shouldn't be attached, well, it doesn't really help because even though you shouldn't be attached, you will still be attached because you need a method to, to actually work this out. And one way 
of helping with non-attachment is to actually uh, look at those attachments in a broader perspective. Uh, yeah, look at things from the point of view of the past and the future, uh, and then try to see what these things we attach to really are. Are they really substantial? Uh, do they really have any real essence? Uh, we know that they are impermanent. So if they are impermanent, why do we attach so much to things that are impermanent? Uh, it's like asking for trouble. Yeah, it's like saying, please, please, may I suffer? Please give me suffering. That's what you were saying because we are attaching to things that we know they are impermanent, then of course you're asking for suffering. So why do we ask for so much suffering? Well, one reason we ask for so much suffering is because we don't really fully appreciate how impermanent these things are. So how can we grasp this impermanence in a more profound way? <clears throat> this is one of the questions that we need to ask. And one of the ways of doing that, which uh, I think becomes quite obvious once you start to think about it, uh, is to look at uh, your life in a broader perspective. Uh, and one of the things that I have sometimes done, you know, you sometimes you go back to places you lived a long time ago, maybe a decade ago or two decades ago or three or four decades ago, and you go back and you look at those places. Uh, you look at the house that maybe you owned. You look at people who were your friends. Oh, friends a long time ago. Yeah. And you go back to that place and you look at it and you wonder what happened. It is so changed. It is no longer the same that it was 30, 40 years ago. Yeah. Was I really attached to this place? Was I attached to this home? Was I attached to these people? And it's almost as if you can, when you go back to those places, it is very hard to recognize them and to understand why you had that attachment that you had a long time ago, because things have changed so much. And you start to feel that these things are actually quite empty. There isn't any real essence to these things. Yeah? There's nothing there that you should really attach to. And if you think into the future, it's a similar kind of thing. Yeah? Yeah? You know that maybe in 10 or 20 years' time, you will be, something will be quite different in your life. And when you look back at the life you have now, some of the people in your life may be dead in 20 years' time. The place you live may be a different one. So you will look back on the life you had now and you will ask yourself, why? Was how, why was I so attached to what existed 20, 30 years ago when everything is so changed? And you start to understand the emptiness even of the attachments that you have now. They're not real. They're not things that you can hold on to. These are very uncertain. And this becomes even more powerful. And this is where the idea of rebirth comes in again. You can see I'm talking about right view and I'm leaving out the ideas of rebirth and karma to a large extent. And the reason I'm leaving them out is because very often they are theoretical. They are too far away. They're not things we can really relate to directly. But once you start to thinking about right view in the more natural sense that I'm doing now, you start to see that rebirth actually also relates to that. So rebirth is like coming in the back door, if you like. I'm not using it immediately, but it still affects how we think about these things. So if you think about your past life, yeah? I was saying before you go back maybe 30, 40 years to how you were viewing things 30, 40 years ago, but go back to your past life. Now, if you go back to your past life, what you will know is that in that past life to her, you were attached to things. In that past life, you had a family. In that past life, you had maybe a husband or a wife. In that past life, you had children, maybe. You had parents, for sure. Yeah, you, everyone has parents. You had a community around you. Maybe you were a Buddhist. Maybe you were living in a certain place. You had all of these attachments. And in your past life, those things were just as important to you as the things you have now are in this life. But what happened to all of those things? What do they mean to you now? 
They mean nothing here. They are completely empty here. Yeah, and you start to wonder, why was I so attached to those things in the past life when they are so empty here, when they pass so quickly here, when they are so incredibly impermanent, then they are gone, completely gone. I can't even remember those things anymore. I have no idea what they even were. They are empty here. There's nothing to them. There's nothing there. And then you start to realize that actually the things in my present life are similar because when I get reborn again into a future life, uh, then there will be new things that I'm attached to. Uh, can you imagine attaching to things in a future life? Uh, you will be attached to a different husband, a different wife, uh, different children, different friends, uh, a different house. Uh, isn't that weird? Uh, and all the things that you have now will be completely gone. Uh, they will be meaningless. They will be pointless to you in a future life. Uh, from the point of view of the future, all the things you have now will be gone. They will be meaningless. And so it is that we cannot carry on always attaching to new things, moving from one life to the next one. We are forced to give up our old attachments. We grieve. We are sad. Sometimes we cry because we have to give up these things. It can be very painful to give up your attachments. And then you get reborn, and then you grasp on to new attachments. And then you are forced again to give up those attachments because you die again. And then you grasp on to new ones. And every time we do this, what we are attaching to is something that actually is empty. There is nothing there to attach to. It passes so quickly. Before you know it, before you know it, it is gone. So if you start to think about your attachments in this very life, in this way, as this empty thing, yeah, which is always, can never be held on to, which is always moving on. And if you look, look back at it from the future, you, can, you start to wonder why on earth was I attached to these things? Actually, they don't have any inherent meaning. They don't have any inherent purpose. And by thinking of the world in this way, what happens is that you start to let go a little bit uh, because you know that these things are not worthy of attachment. Uh, there's nothing there that is really can be held on to. Uh, and when you do that, uh, the nekama, the renunciation is happening right there within you right now. Uh, and I'm sure each one of you who is listening to this, you know that there are times in your life when you have more attachment uh, there are other times when you feel less attachment. Sometimes attachment can be very strong here. Yeah? Yeah? And that gives you an idea when you are free of some of those attachments, uh, you feel more free. Yeah? You feel more independent. Uh, you feel more your own agent in the world. Uh, and this is a way of just gradually encouraging that movement uh, towards greater detachment, uh, where you are more free, where you are more independent. Uh, so when you eventually you come to your deathbed and everything has to go in this world, you are ready because you are independent from the things in this world. So this is how the idea of not attaching to the future, not attaching to the past, not even attaching to what you have now, how it actually leads towards meditation. Yeah, it leads to a giving up of these things. It leads to a... Uh, rejection of things that are not really worthy of being attached to. Uh, and in this way, you can come back to the meditation, let the world be, and then focus on those things that actually are important. Uh, because there is one thing that you do take with you. Yeah, there is one thing that you can attach to a little bit. Uh, and what is that thing that you can attach to? Well, that is your good conduct. Uh, it is your kindness, it is your generosity, your compassion. Because when, remember the Buddha always said that you are the owner of your kama. So when you are attaching to these good qualities inside of you, you are attaching to something higher. You're attaching to something which leads you in the right direction. And you're letting go of those things that are problematic. Yeah, the things in the world that never take you where you want to go. So the idea of attachment here is that you grab a rung, a higher rung, yeah, and you use that higher rung to let go of the lower rungs. And as you do that, you can kind of lift yourself up 
out of the quagmire, out of the problems of the world. And then you will be heading in the right direction. And then when you attach to kindness, when you attach to care, when you attach to compassion, when you attach to understanding people in the world in the right way, then uh, you are you have something that you actually do take with you into the future. These other qualities actually do go with you. So these qualities are much more real than the things in the world. They are real because they are internal to you. They are internal, they come with your mind. And because they come with your mind, they're also carried with you into the future as a consequence. So in that sense, they are much more real then. Let go of the world outside. Focus on the qualities within. Yeah, this is exactly what meditation is about. And this is exactly what you're seeing here in this verse from the Bad Eka Ratta Sutta. So give up the past, give up the future. Yeah, don't hope for the future. If you hope for the future, you're going to think about it. Don't run back to the past because you are attached to it. Because what is past is left behind and the future has not arrived. Future hasn't arrived, so it's a waste of time thinking about it. But also, if you want to create a good future, it is the wrong way to go about creating that by thinking about it. Thinking about it never gives a wrong future, it never gives a good future. It is letting go that gives you a good future because then you are developing the good qualities. So um, this are just a few ways of thinking about the past and the future. And uh, please just, you know, these are things or thoughts that you really need to develop in your own life because as you develop them, they become kind of your way of dealing with the world, yeah? your way of learning to think about the world in the right way. And when they become your way of thinking about it, when you know that this is true, that is when it becomes powerful. So let's go on to the, uh, the next verse. The next verse says that, uh, no, I, I'm going to stay verse number two. Yeah, so please go back again, uh, Lai. Yeah, yeah. And phenomena in the present uh, are clearly seen in every case. Knowing this, foster it, uh, unfaltering, unshakable. Uh, so here is this idea that when you give up all of this attachment, yeah, attachment, whether it's to the past or the future or even to the present, uh, well, then you stay in the present. Yeah? You hang out in the present. Uh, the phenomena of the present here are the Pachupanna Dhamma, it is called in the Pali language. Uh, and this is the, um, uh, basically what is happening right here and right now. Uh, and they, they are clearly seen in every case. The Pali here is a, a vipassati, and this is related to the idea of vipassana. Yeah, it is the idea of seeing things clearly. And uh, when we talk about seeing things clearly, uh, which I think is a very good translation of vipassana, by the way, sometimes we call it insight, but I think insight is too elevate it. It is often more basic than that. It's just the ability to see the world in the right way. Yeah. So uh, uh, to do that, uh, initially, there's many levels to seeing things in the right way. So first of all, when you give up the past and the future, some of the things that you see in the present are the problems. Yeah. You start to see the hindrances. You start to see the attachments that you have. You start to see the things that block you from being peaceful. You start to see the flaws in your conduct, perhaps your sila and all of these things. So giving up the past and the future is just a very preliminary way of being able to be in the present. Yeah. So Pachudam, a very simple way of understanding the seeing things clearly in the present. It begins with understanding your own situation. Don't make these things too complicated. Don't make them uh, too hard to fathom. Yeah? To like call it Vipassana meditation and you want to have insight into the three characteristics. I will talk about this later also, but remember the easy stages of this, yeah, the preliminary stages of these things, uh, the preliminary stages of these things, that just understanding some very simple things about what is happening inside of you. Uh, 
Am I, do I get angry very easily? And if I do get angry, who is it that I get angry with? Where are these problems? Do I have strong desires anywhere? Well, if I have strong desires, well, how can I give up these things? What, what do I desire anyway? Does it make any sense, these kind of desires? And as you learn to see the world in the way I was suggesting before, you give up some of those desires because you see they're actually useless. It does not really get me anywhere. Yeah. And then there is the attachments in your life. You start to see those clearly as well, as I was saying before. So this is really often the initial part. And this is often like an everyday ability to see things clearly as you go through your everyday life. Yeah, the, the purification of the mind, moving it toward more wholesome qualities, having more compassion in the world. Yeah, seeing the news on the TV, seeing the wars going on, and then feeling compassion for people because you know it's just suffering here. Yeah. This is seeing these things clearly and rightly in the present, uh, developing good qualities, abandoning the bad ones. Uh. So this is like part of right effort. Yeah, all of this we were talking about now is in a sense part of right effort. Uh. And you may say that, well, I just said it was right view. Now I'm saying it is right effort. Uh. So what is it? Is it right view or is it right effort? Please be clear. Yeah, <laughs> Tell us the truth. We don't want to hear clearly what is going on. Are you one thing or is it the other? And the idea is that right effort and right view are very closely related to each other. It's one of those interesting things that you can also find in the suttas. Yeah, and one of the suttas that talk about this is the sutta in Majjhima middle length sayings, 117. It's called the Maha Chattarisaka Sutta, the Great Forty. And in that sutta, it says that uh, to have right view, you have to have right effort. Yeah, right effort is one of the aspects of getting right view. Why is that the case? Well, because right view requires you to reflect about the world. Right view requires you to reflect about your experience, your immediate experience. It requires you to reflect on the suttas. It requires you to connect your experience with what the suttas are saying. Then you get right view. Right view is not something which is just there. Right view is not something you can just say, I believe in rebirth, now I have right view. It is not as simple as that. We need to put in the effort for right view to arise. Gradually, gradually, you straighten out your view. Gradually, gradually, you come closer to the way the Buddha was thinking. And very often, it is quite simple. Yeah, it is the understanding of not, as I've just been talking about, holding on to the past, having hopes for the future, the defilements in the present moment, how to overcome them, how to understand anger and ill will in the right way, how to have a very sim simple sense of letting go and renunciation by giving up your attachments. This is that kind of right view. But to understand this deeply, you have to reflect about it. You have to say, yeah, this actually makes sense. And when it starts to make sense to you, you think, yeah, does it make sense? You think, yeah, it makes sense. This is actually real, yeah. Then it has a powerful effect on you. It has an emotional effect and things that have an emotional effect, they become a force for your practice because we are driven by emotions. It is emotions that matter in our life. When you feel strongly about something, when you are inspired to work hard or to do something, that is when you have success. Emotions are what drive us. And to have those emotions, you have to have that right view. To have that right view, you have to you have the effort to really understand what is going on. And then when you understand it, then these things start to happen. Right view, right effort coming together. So you clearly see, by clearly seeing, you are making the effort to understand things in the right way. And then the right view becomes established as a consequence. So all of these things have to come together in this way. Huh? Then we will have some degree of success. Huh? Okay. Okay.
everyone. So I hope you had a good lunch and you uh, are now in the, not uh, too much lunch, just the right amount, uh, the middle way <laughs> when it comes to lunch. Too much is always a bad idea, too little also a bad idea. So uh, middle way, as the Buddha always recommends. So uh, let us continue uh, where we left off. Uh, we were looking at the uh, second verse of this famous Bad Ekarata Sutta, and we, the verse basically saying that uh, phenomena in the present are clearly seen in every case. And we're discussing this idea, what this means. And uh, of course, we're going to see how the Buddha talks about this in a second, because the explanation of the Buddha comes afterwards. Uh, but I think it's often also useful to understand these in a uh, often in a more kind of ordinary way, because the way the Buddha explains things is often very profound. And uh, very often you may feel a bit left out. If you just listen to the Buddha, you may feel that this does not apply to me. <laughs> and that sometimes happens because the suttas tend to look at things from a very high point of view. So it's useful to kind of come back to the ordinary ways and these things in that these things are to be understood. So when we talk about seeing phenomena in the present, as I mentioned before, we are talking about uh, understanding whatever is happening here in the daily, even in daily life, yeah, understanding, being aware, having some degree of awareness of your mental states, uh, being sure that you regulate your emotional life in a reasonably good way. You don't get upset too easy. You have a sense of compassion and care for the people around you. And when you have this, if you use ordinary awareness of daily life in this way, it's going to be very powerful because it undermines the defilements of the mind. It purifies you. And in the long run, it leads you towards more powerful meditation as a consequence. So it starts seeing phenomena, it begins like this. And then as your mind is purified to a sufficient state, then it allows meditation to happen. Yeah, it's kind of interesting when your mind is reasonably pure, you sit down, you meditate, and you find that meditation is so much easier. Yeah, before you may not have been able to watch the breath properly because your thoughts were kind of going all over the place, or you're feeling a lot of uh, tiredness and lethargy and these kind of things. Uh, but then one day, because you practice in the right way, you purify yourself. Uh, it is as if the mindfulness becomes natural. Uh, and when the mindfulness becomes natural, meditation becomes possible. Uh, so seeing phenomena in the present, uh, when, when um, mindfulness is natural, uh, is quite easy. Yeah? It just means that you are sitting back uh, uh, you are mindful, the breath is there, and you can follow the breath with a fair amount of ease. So this is another aspect of the idea of clearly seeing phenomena in the present. Sometimes you may think that, well, seeing phenomena in the present is a kind of vipassana practice. It's a practice whereby you learn to see the arising and passing away of things. But remember that samatha and vipassana are not really separable. So if you do mindfulness of breathing, and we will look at this later on, you are in fact practicing both samatha and vipassana. You are giving rise to more clarity. You're seeing things more clearly, as well as becoming more calm. These two things have to go together. They cannot really be separated. So by watching the breath very carefully in this particular case, you are practicing both samatha and vipassana, the clear seeing of the breath. And then you practice that mindfulness of breathing. You take it deeper and deeper. Yeah, it goes down and down and down. You become more and more peaceful. Meditation becomes more and more powerful until eventually you enter the states of samadhi. Yeah, you famous states of samadhi you find in the suttas, the jhanas and, and any, all of these pre-jhana states. One of the things that is so remarkable about the Buddhist path is that there's so much happiness and so much peace to be had before you get to the jhanas. Yeah, there's this wonderful and amazing path of just more and more peace, more and more bliss until eventually you get to the jhana states themselves. And uh, so you deepen that knowledge. Uh, and it, as it says in this verse, after clearly seeing in every case, it says, knowing this, uh, 
foster it. Foster it means like to develop it. Yeah, you develop it, you make much of it. Uh, you make sure that that uh, meditation is taken as deep as you possibly can. Uh, and then the last two words there are kind of interesting, unfaltering and unshakable. Uh, these are, the idea here is that when the meditation becomes very profound, uh, your mind becomes very solid and very stable uh, and very able to see things, uh, see things that you have never seen before, things that are very hard to see, things that, um, uh, you know, things that might scare you if you saw it in an ordinary mind state, because uh, the delusion that we have is challenged. And when you challenge delusion, uh, actually it can become scary. Yeah, just like, um, you know, you, you, you know, you, um, uh, you, you see something that you're not used to seeing that is always kind of challenging to us. Uh, so you need this very powerful mind. And when you have this very powerful mind, unfaltering, unshakable, kind of implying the jhana states, implying deep states of meditation, that is when you are ready to really see things in the full way, all the way to enlightenment itself, certainly to stream entry, but all the way to enlightenment itself. So you can see how these two verses are very, they're very deep and they're very all-encompassing. Almost the entire path is kind of included in these verses here. At the very beginning, when we talk about not turning back to the past and the future, in the large aspect, it is about right view, yeah, looking at the world in the right way. And with that right view comes the uh, ideas of you know, compassion for the world, of not being angry with the world, uh, and all of these kind of things. Uh, comes the samma, sankapa, and also the element of uh, uh, renunciation, which means giving up the ordinary world, which then... Uh, allows you to enter samadhi states and eventually see things according to reality because your mind is very powerful. There's a lot of information in those two verses. And uh, you, know, you can read them in a profound way or in a more ordinary way, but there's a lot of information in there. It's so very kind of fascinating to uh, kind of pull them apart a little bit. So then comes the... Um, the last two of the verses here, and uh, the, the third verse, again, I'll just read it out again. Today is the day to keenly work. Who knows tomorrow may bring death, for there is no bargain to be struck with death and his mighty hordes. Yeah, so the, this is a reminder that um, the time to practice, uh, the time to live in a good way, the time to forgive, the time to have compassion, the time to understand things in the right way, the time to say a kind word to the people around you, the time to, um, all of these things that are so important on the Buddhist path. Uh, now is the time, not later on. Uh, right in this moment, then right now is the time to have the right kind of thought. Uh, because if you don't do it now, basically it may never happen. Uh, it is so easy to procrastinate because we think that there are other things in the world that are more important. Uh, yeah, you've got to get that project sorted out. Uh, you have to uh, get some work done that is very important for you uh, uh, and all of these kind of things. And so all the things in the world tend to seem more important uh, than the spiritual path. Uh, but remember, it is actually the other way around. Uh, it is a spiritual path that is more important uh, because all the things in the world, all they do uh, is that they kind of they do a little bit for you in this life, uh, and they have a little bit of effect on how you experience the world, uh, but only a tiny amount of effect. Uh, what really matters uh, for how you live your life, uh, what really matters for how you experience this life itself, uh, is actually the spiritual qualities that you have with you. And I'm sure many of you are aware of this already, but it's so important to turn things the right side up uh, and not get them the wrong way around. Uh, and so the way to think about this, when you remember the idea that you're going to die, life is, life is short, we don't know how long this life is around. Uh, when you remember that, it means that you place spirituality, uh, kindness, yeah, the idea of mental development on the top uh, and all the worldly things underneath that. Uh, yeah, that, the other things come underneath. Uh, spirituality is the prime reason why we are in this life in the first place. Uh, this is what life really is about. Uh, so everything should come back to the idea of spirituality. Uh, and what that means is that when we, you can still 
you know, do the ordinary things in your life. We have to do the ordinary things. We have to look after our jobs and families. We can't throw these things out. They are important things. Even in monastic life, there are a number of worldly things that you have to do. It's just part of existence. <laughs> Don't have much choice in it. So, but you remember, yeah, you remember that even when you do your worldly things that need to be done, you do them in the way that is spiritual. You do them in a way where you remember how you are doing these things. You don't, don't allow yourself to be carried away by the worldly things. You remember what actually matters. And to be able to do this, this is why the Buddha here brings, it, brings in the idea of death. Yeah? Death is one of these very powerful contemplations in Buddhism. It's one of these things that um, uh, the Buddha recommends everywhere in the suttas. Uh, and he always talks about death as being one of the things everyone should contemplate. Everyone should contemplate death. Yeah? The Buddha specifically says, lay people and monastics. He says women and men. Yeah? So everyone there is, should contemplate death. The only, the only ones that are not mentioned are the animals. The animals don't have to contemplate death because uh, it's too hard for animal <laughs> to contemplate death. But if you are born as a human being, you should contemplate death. He doesn't say anything about ghosts and devas, but they too probably should contemplate death, right? It's a very broad thing. It I, I, would be interesting whether the Buddha, I don't think the Buddha ever said to the devas, you should contemplate death, but they should, yeah? Because this matters even for the devas. They too need to live well. And death is such a powerful thing because death is like this barrier. It's like the end of our life. And when you remember that you're going to die, you also remember what is important in life. Because if you remember yourself, you see yourself on your deathbed, on your deathbed, all the things in the world become irrelevant. Remember what I said before, when you look back to your past life, all the things that you were attached to in your past life, all the things that meant something to you in your past life, it's all gone can't access it anymore. It's become irrelevant, yeah? And death is that barrier in this life. You want to, at that point, all you care about are the qualities that you have built up that you can take with you into the future. And these are precisely the spiritual qualities. So death is something that makes our mind become straight. It makes us see things in a, in the, in a way which actually allows us to remember what is really important in life. Uh, yeah? It gets our priorities uh, sorted out when we remember death. Uh, so please uh, make the idea of just of reminding yourself that you're going to die. Yeah? I'm going to die for goodness sake. Yeah? And not only am I going to die, I don't know when I'm going to die. Yeah? What if I'm going to die right now? Am I ready to die right now? Feel inside of yourself if you're ready to die right now. And if you're not ready to die right now, you've got to get ready. Yeah, because actually, the, because we never know, the only time we can be ready is now. So these are the kind of questions that sometimes we can ask ourselves. And when we ask ourselves these questions, and then we do some death contemplation, maybe we can do a death guided death meditation later on. It's kind of nice to do a guided death meditation because actually it's very pleasant to do death meditation. People think that death meditation is very scary. No, it is very pleasant. It's very peaceful if you know how to do it and you do it in the right way. It's peaceful because you tend to let go. Death reminds you that there's nothing to hold on to. And when you let go, you become peaceful. By renouncing, peace arises in your mind as a consequence. So death is another thing that we can bring into this. Yeah? The idea of death, bring into this to make this whole process of letting go of things more powerful. And uh, often the idea of death really deserves a whole talk in its own right, because it's actually very, very beautiful. And the Buddha talks about these things in many places in the suttas. Uh, but I think for the purposes of uh, this particular retreat, maybe, uh, maybe that this is uh, probably uh, about enough about the idea of dying here. Yeah. But please use this, uh, because uh, the Buddha talks about this, you know that the idea of death is very important in the suttas uh, because you see it in many different places. Uh, the Buddha talks about it again and again and again, uh, yeah, this idea of bringing this up. Uh, and then you find that actually you become a better 
person as a consequence. It's very strange. People are afraid of death, but we are all going to die. You don't have any, we don't have any choice in the matter. It's going to happen. And so you might as well get used to it. And if we're not used to it, it's going to be much more difficult when it eventually happens. So I would really recommend you to uh, contemplate this occasionally. So let's look at the uh, end here. Yeah, the, the Buddha says this beautiful saying here, first of all, the third verse, there is no bargain to be struck with death and his mighty hordes. And this is Mara, Mara and the hordes of Mara. There is no bargain. Yeah, you can... You cannot pray to Mara and say, Mara, please, I don't want to die. It doesn't work. No bargain can be struck. There's no business deal. To, Mara doesn't do business deals. Mara just kind of slaughters you down and cuts your life short. And there you are, finished. And there's no business. I will give you everything I own. Please, please keep me alive. Whatever you want, I will give it to you. And then... Uh, uh, Sorry, just something happened here. What happened to the, uh, the screen? Yeah, sorry, Ajahn, I, was, uh, I did something. Yep. Okay, okay, there we are. Okay, so, there, so Mara doesn't do any business deals. Now, it's interesting, one of the little stories that actually come to mind right now from the suttas, which is kind of fascinating here. This is a very famous story of Jivaka. You may have heard about Jivaka. Jivaka was the Buddha's physician, the Buddha's doctor, and he was also the doctor of the whole Sangha. And there's a long story about Jivaka found in the Vinaya Pitaka, which tells a little bit about his background, how he became a doctor, and how he was very clever, very skilled. There is the first occurrence of brain, brain surgery, right? Brain surgery. This was done by Dr. Jivaka. I think this may be very well the first occurrence of brain surgery in the world? I don't know, I've never, I don't think there was any other literature about brain surgery, but this actually found in the suttas. So he opens up the skull. You can imagine open up, opening up someone's skull two and a half thousand years ago, it would have been quite scary. I don't know how they, how they did that, but that's what they did. It's kind of astonishing, yeah. Brain surgery at the time of the Buddha. So he was a very special doctor. And because he was so special, everyone wanted to have him as a doctor, yeah. And, one of the famous stories is all the people, they ordained to become monks because they knew the only way they could get access to Jivaka as a doctor was to become a monk. If you were not a monk, if you were a lay person, he didn't have any time for you. He only had time for the monks and for the king and for the king's kind of uh, uh, entourage, you know, the king's kind of um, workers or whatever, or, and wives, but not for anyone else. So people would ordain to become monks. Then they would go to Jivika and say, I'm a monk, please uh, treat me, I have this illness. Uh, and then Jivika would treat them, and then they would disrobe. <laughs> and then Jivika would say, but you were a monk just a few days ago, how come you're a lay person now? Oh yeah, no, I, I just wanted to be treated by you, sorry, I just, that's the only reason I became a monk. <laughs> so then Jivika, he went to the uh, Buddha and said, please stop people to becoming monks just to be treated by me. And this is why one of the reasons we have a rule in the Vinaya Pitaka that says that, uh, uh, you know, you have to be healthy to become a monk. There are certain illnesses you cannot have. But then there was all these other people, very, very wealthy people at the time of the Buddha. The world has always been the same. Lots of ordinary people and then a few very, very wealthy people there. And these wealthy people, like everyone else, sometimes they become very ill. So they will go to the uh, Jivaka and they will say, I will give you everything I own, everything I own in life, I will give to you if you can make me healthy again. Please cure me of this illness. I will give you everything. Not only will I give you everything, I will also become your slave. <laughs> That's what they said, yes, I will become your slave and then please give me everything and I will give you everything at the same time. And that's kind of fascinating. It shows you the fear of death. Yeah, we would like to do anything. We would like to bargain with Mara. We would like to say to Mara, I will pay you if I possibly can. Everything, I don't want to die here. So if you want to avoid that, uh, if you want to avoid getting to the end of your life uh, and being in this precarious position where you want to bargain with Mara, build up those good qualities now. And if you have a lot of good qualities within, you will not be afraid of death. 
yeah, we are afraid of death because we fear the future, because we fear what's going to happen on the other side. And we also are also afraid of letting go. But if you have a heart of metta, if you have a heart of compassion, really develop metta to the very highest extent. If you have compassion for the whole world, even for those little irritating insects you get during meditation practice, yeah? All of that. If you have compassion for all of those things and you have metta for the whole world, you will never be afraid of death. Death is just like another transition. You are transitioning from one state to another. You don't know what the future will bring exactly, but you know it's going to be good. You know the future will be good. This is kind of the point of having metta practice. You're no longer afraid of what is going to happen later on. Have you had that feeling before? Where you feel that, wow, I feel so much kindness for the whole world. And when you have that powerful feeling inside of kindness for everyone in the whole world, everything, all human beings, all animals, all ghosts, you feel kindness towards the ghosts, not afraid of the ghosts, everything, yeah, you have kindness towards uh, at that point, uh, you don't have any fear anymore. Even the idea of dying, you know that nothing bad can happen to you as a consequence. Uh, very powerful uh, side effect, if you like, uh, of practicing metta. The fear of death is completely gone. Uh, and um, the other kind of beautiful side effect of metta, uh, not being afraid of death is one of them, but I was out saying before about the idea of giving up attachments to the things in the world, yeah, and how wonderful it can be to give up those attachments. And that is true, but to be able to give up attachments can be very difficult very often, yeah? because even if you do these kind of contemplations, it may be that your mind is not ready to give up those attachments. But if you have metta, if you have kindness, if you have compassion in your heart, if you have these good qualities within, then the idea of letting go is far, far easier. This is why these things always come together. That is why the three sankapas, the three samma sankapa, the three right intentions are go together as one package deal. You have the you have the avyapada sankapa, which is like metta. You have the ahingsaka sankapa, which is like compassion. And then you have the nekama sankapa, which is the intention to renounce. And they come together. Kindness comes together with renunci renunciation because it is only when you have something more profound that renunciation really becomes possible. So we should never renounce out of ill will. We should never give up because we are irritated with somebody. Yeah, I'm going to renounce my friendship with you because I don't like you or have a, I have a hard time with you. If you renounce a friendship like that because you have a hard time with somebody, it is going to be very bad. It's not going to work. It is not real renunciation. Renunciation comes when you have metta. Renunciation comes when you feel kindness to everyone around you, and then you renounce. Yeah, You renounce attachment. You don't renounce kindness. You renounce attachment to that person. Metta renunciation coming together. Never try to force yourself to renounce through an act of ill will or whatever. Then it's going to be very problematic. Yeah? So this is the idea of death and how to avoid some of the problems around death. Yeah? And then we have the very last verse of this little poem. And it goes as follows again. The peaceful sage explained it's those who keenly meditate like this, tireless all night and day, who truly have that one fine night. Yeah, the peaceful sage, the beautiful word Santo Muni. This is the Buddha, of course, the peaceful sage. And uh, he is the one who explained that this is how, if you want to have a really good night, uh, it is one who practices in this way all day and night, uh, then you know you had, a, had one fine night indeed. Uh, this is a really a fine night. Uh, and of course, the majority of people think you are crazy if you say this is a fine night. Uh, Majority of people, they want to enjoy themselves, they want to amuse themselves, they want to go out, they are fed up of COVID restrictions, now they want to go back to the nightclubs and the entertainments around the world, or whatever it is. But the person who is really on the spiritual path, they just want to be peaceful. They want to be left to themselves. They want to contemplate death even. <laughs> and it's kind of crazy how different we are as 
you know, when you practice a spiritual path uh, compared to when you're an ordinary person in the world. Uh, so this is how you become that peaceful sage. Uh, at Bodhinyana Monastery, we have one of the Anagarikas, if you have been here, he's called, he calls himself Santo Muni. I guess he's trying to be a bit like the Buddha, perhaps, I'm not sure. So uh, this is the path, this is the way to uh, having a really successful night. When you have that clarity of mind, you have insight, uh, you have a lot of joy and happiness as a consequence. Uh, and of course, this kind of joy and happiness you get from this kind of uh, um, experience is far more profound than anything you can find in the world. Uh, and this is why this is the higher way of spending a good night, one fine night indeed. Uh, so that is my uh, br brief commentary, it's only a brief commentary on those verses. But uh, we want to have a look at how the Buddha explains this as well. So because the way the Buddha explains things, as I always say, is always more profound. Yeah? So uh, we want to see what the Buddha has to see. So then the Buddha says, he said, and that's what I meant when I said, uh, I shall teach you the passage for recitation and the analysis of one fine night. That is what the Buddha said. Oh, no, we, are, we have lost a large part of the sutta. Yeah. We have to go back up again, please. The middle part is gone. Yeah, that whole part is gone. Yeah. Higher up, please. Yeah. That's it, that's good, yeah, yeah. You can go down, you can go down to the prose passage now. So now the Buddha is gonna explain yeah, what he means. Uh, well, this is the part right here. Huh? So this is the Buddha's uh, way of explaining this. Uh, and how do you not run back to the past? Uh, you must you muster delight there, thinking I had such form in the past. I had such feelings in the past. I had such perceptions in the past. Uh, I had such choices yeah, or intentions in the past. Uh, I had such consciousness in the past. Uh, that's how you run back to the past. And uh, so uh, what the Buddha is saying here is very similar to what I was saying before, this idea of thinking about the past, yeah, going through the photo album, seeing those old pictures and thinking, wow, it was so nice before. You know, I was young and everything was good. My body, wow, such form. When you say such form in the past, it just means the body, basically. Yeah, what you looked like before. And you kind of now you grieve because you have lost the beauty of youth or whatever it is. And you're getting old and weak. I was so strong in the past. Now weakness is kind of overtaking me I, and, and all of these kind of things. Uh, yeah, it, it is as simple as that. It is just any kind of way where we grieve over what happened in the past. Uh, you had such feelings in the past, yeah? The idea that we, in the past, I was more happy in the past, but now somehow the happiness seems to be gone, yeah? In the past, I had perceptions. In the past, my meditation was better. My meditation has gone down. I had perceptions of happiness. Uh, in the past, I used to, uh, live in a different house. I had this beautiful house around me. That perception of house uh, has now gone. Oh, I don't have that anymore. Uh, anything, anything that you think about the past uh, and you think it was better, yeah? The choices I had in the past, maybe the idea is here that uh, in the past, I was more able to choose what I wanted. Uh, because in the past, maybe I was more wealthy or I was more uh, able to choose because I was stronger in the body. Or, uh, or whatever, uh, my ability to choose was greater in the past. Uh, and consciousness, well, that's just awareness of what happened in the past. Uh, so this is really just a way of dividing up the past in a certain way. But really, it is no different from thinking about the past in any particular way. Yeah? Whenever you are controlled by the past and you hold on to that, uh, that is when you have uh, this kind of problem. Uh, and uh, the idea of dividing it up into the five khandhas that you see here is just to enable you to focus a bit more clearly on what is going on, pinning it down. And the five khandhas are, of course, the framework for understanding the idea of non-self. And because they are the framework for understanding non-self, then that is why they are used in this particular way right here. Uh, we are dealing with uh, the idea of uh, 
not running back to the past. Yeah, how do you run back to your past? You think about these five khandas, you think, wow, it was so it was so nice. Or it can be that you feel bad about the past and you have had a trauma in your life. It's very common for people to have some kind of trauma. And then you think about the past and you feel, oh no, that was terrible. And you carry the past with you into the present and into the future. So these are two opposite ways, two opposite things that can happen here. And uh, so we need to let go of that. Uh, yeah, we need to kind of uh, uh, not, not do this. And uh, the way to do that uh, is, well, if it is a trauma that you had in the past, uh, you need to forgive. You need to forgive whatever, pe whatever people were there, whatever people may have treated you in a bad way. You need to at least try to forgive, yeah? Slowly, slowly moving in the right direction. It can be very hard to forgive if someone has treated you very, very badly, maybe as a child or whatever. Uh, but uh, still, you can do a little bit, uh, yeah? And by thinking in the right way, uh, by remembering that these people are just following habits. They often don't know what they're doing. They try to be kind, but don't really understand what kindness is. And maybe they were treated bad in return by other people. And so by thinking like this, you can, give up, you can let go of some of the traumas of the past, at least a little bit. You can reduce the pain of the past. And if you are attached to some kind of happiness in the past, then uh, remember, first of all, what I said before. Uh, it's very hard to remember the past. We never see the past in the right way. Uh, we tend to think of the past in a certain way, but actually it is very likely that it was quite different. Uh, sometimes all we remember are the good times and we forgot about the bad times. Uh, and uh, by having a realistic idea of the past, uh, you can start to let go. Uh, and the other idea that I was mentioning before is the idea of uh, now is when you make your future. You don't make your future by thinking about the past. If you think about the past and you're attached to that, you are not doing anything at all for your future. In fact, the opposite, more likely you are dragging yourself down. You're making your future worse by thinking about the past because attachments and holdings on, these are just cravings and these cravings will often lead you astray here. And sometimes they lead you to maybe do things, make bad choices and all of these kinds of things. So uh, uh, now is the time to move forward. Now is the time to look to the future. And the looking to the future means living well, not fantasizing about the future, not thinking about the sensory realm. And then you are on the right track. Yeah. So a little bit of wisdom like this, yeah? a little bit of uh, reflecting in the right way. Yeah? should help you to let go of the past uh, a little bit. And this is what the next one the Buddha says, how do you not run back to the past? You don't find delight there. I prefer find delight. You don't find delight there thinking, I had such form in the past. I had such feelings in the past. I had such perceptions in the past. I had such choices in the past. I had such consciousness in the past. And that's how you don't run back to the past. <laughs> it's, it's funny because the way the Buddha says it, it is just so kind of short. Yeah, it is, you just do it, you don't think about it, that's all. And you're kind of finished with it. And it sounds so easy when you say it in that way. But, uh, and this is why it is useful to have a bit of commentary because uh, uh, it's not easy to know exactly how you're supposed to do this. The Buddha just says, don't do it. And that's really all he says. <laughs> so uh, use some of these techniques. Uh, use some of the techniques the Buddha you, talks about elsewhere in the suttas. Uh, we'll talk more, much more about this later on. Some of the similes the Buddha talks about for the sensory realm and all of these kind of things. Uh, and all of these things will help you to let go of, of the past and also the future. And in fact, the entire sensory realm altogether, you can let go of through these ideas. So, um, and this is one of the problems sometimes with the suttas. The suttas are so short. They just give you a very bare bones. They give you like the skeleton. And then we have to kind of add the meat to the skeleton. 
it's not easy. You know, you, you read this and you think, okay, this is all very good, but it doesn't really give you all that much information on how, how to do these things. And this is why we have commentaries. And the commentaries, they often help you to find these solutions. And uh, I have always liked Ajahn Brahm commentary, the famous commentary by Ajahn Brahm. You know, whenever Ajahn Brahm gives a talk, that's called the Ajahn Brahm commentary. <laughs> Very useful, yeah, because it gives you information about these things. And right now, I am giving a commentary on this. And I try also to do the same thing, bring out the meaning of this. How can we actually do it? And in the end, you have to become your own commentary here. Yeah, you have to find out yourself what you think. Yeah. And uh, sometimes people do that. They come to me and say, oh, this is what I think. Is that right? Uh, and that's great. You know, please, please do that. Please uh, think about these things for yourself uh, and make, find ways of dealing with these issues so that you can also give rise to that mindfulness and let go of the past or the future uh, in this way. Uh. And the Buddha says, and how do you hope for the future? Uh? You find delight there thinking, may I have such form in the future? May I have such feeling in the future? May I have such perceptions in the future? May I have such choices in the future? May I have such consciousness in the future? That's how you hope for the future. Yeah, this is um, uh, like the uh, simile of the dream. Yeah, and I, I didn't mention this before, but it's a beautiful simile. I, I'll come back to it later on as well. Uh, this idea, the idea of the future that we have in our minds, where we're going to go, where we're going to be here. When you are young, when you go into university, you often have very strong ideas about what, you, what is going to happen in your life. Uh, you have strong ideas about what kind of work you're going to have, uh, strong ideas about who you're going to be married to, who is going to be your wife or husband, uh, strong ideas about how successful you're going to be or, or whatever it is. Uh, and uh, so we always look to the future. Uh, it is especially true when we are young uh, and then you fall in love with someone. This is what happens when you're young. And then when you fall in love with someone, it is so are completely unrealistic. We have these crazy ideas about what it's like to be in a relationship. Yeah? And we all know that when you get married, it is actually quite different. It is not really like that relationship that we thought it was going to be. Yeah, it is just so utterly uncertain. So we have the hopes for the future, and the hopes are not true. Life is never the way we think it is going to be. You're looking forward to buying a new house. But then you forget that when you get that new house, and that house is like a perception here, yeah? It's a feeling, so it's part of these things. Uh, may you have this perception and feeling. We forget that the house needs to be clean. There's a lot of work cleaning the house. We forget that the house starts to deteriorate. You have to repair it all the time, yeah? We forget that there is a mortgage you have to pay off. Uh, we forget that other people may be not treating your property with the respect that it deserves. There's all these downsides, but when you think about it in your mind, it sounds so beautiful. It sounds so wonderful to have this house. And, um, you know, my house, I have a house too. It's called the Kuti. It's a, <laughs> a small house at Bodhinana Monastery. It's a seven square meters large, yeah, seven square meters. And seven square meters is just exactly right. It's just enough to sleep. There's enough to have a desk in there. I can do a bit of work. And just enough to have my meditation seat. Yeah. And that's all there is. And very easy to clean. It takes about five minutes to clean it out. Very, very efficient way of cleaning the place. So I am really, really happy with my tiny little cutie. And I sometimes I look at all these big houses, you know, in Perth, there are so many large houses along the river, beautifully on the ocean front and very nice. And I think, no way I want to live in those mansions. Sometimes they are like mansions, enormous. Yeah? And uh, sometimes the, the problem with those mansions is that they are often too close together. There's one next to the other one. Uh, but when I come back to Bodhinyana Monastery, uh, I have one cutie by myself in the forest. Uh, completely isolated from everyone else, where it is peaceful, it is quiet. All I have is the kangaroos and the mosquitoes as my friends, yeah? And sometimes the, even the mosquitoes actually, if they don't, they, I don't know if they are friends, but you know, they are, they're, they're actually, they're all right <laughs> if you get used to them. 
And it is far better to live in nature like that in a small place uh, than to have a large mansion in a crowded city. Far, far better. Yeah. It is so much more conducive to happiness. Yeah, you actually feel happiness in a little cutie like that. You're living in a big mansion in the city. It doesn't do very much to, for you at all. Yeah. So our ideas about the future are so wrong. Yeah. And again, as I was saying before, what you do then, once you understand that all this dreaming that we have about the future, all the fantasies we have about the future, they're always false. They're always fake. It never works out like that. The future is always going to be different from what you think it is. And you start to realize that because of the uncertainty of that future, because it depends not only on your work or what you make out of it, it depends on all of these things over which you have no control. You have no control of what's happening in the world. You have no control of what's happening with the government very often. We don't have any control over the environmental issues in the world. We have no control over the next wars. It's just so uncertain. And then you let it go. You let it be. You don't worry about it anymore. And you start to know, actually, my future, I'm going to make it right now by being kind, by being a good person, by having a good heart, by meditating, by being peaceful and compassionate and kind and caring and having a sense of metta for everyone. That is what I'm going to do. And then you are creating a future. Then you have hope for the future. But that is not the hope that you dream about. That is a hope that you create now by being kind. It is not a hope that you think about. It is a hope that just, it is just a future that emerges from your present actions. So in that sense, it is quite different. So how do you not hope for the future? Well, again, you do not find delight in the future. Yeah, because there's nothing there to find delight in. Thinking, may I have such form in the future? May I have such feelings in the future? May I have such perceptions in the future? May I have such choices in the future? May I have such consciousness in the future? That's how you don't hope for the future. So you avoid the hoping for the future. And uh, because you understand that the future is just too uncertain. Huh? And one of the little mantras that I've been using recently, which is kind of really nice, uh, and I've been telling people about, is uh, the mantra, expect the unexpected. Huh? Expect the unexpected. Huh? Understand that the world is always going to throw up something really out of left field, uh, something you had never expected at all. Huh? So expect the unexpected. Huh? And it's a beautiful little saying. It's, you, you may think, well, that's an oxymoron. That's just, uh, you know, that's a contradiction in terms. How can you expect the unexpected? Uh, but uh, the truth is that you, you cannot, of course, expect specific things to happen. That's impossible. But what you can have, you can have a general idea of expecting the unexpected. Uh, the fact that you don't become surprised, yeah, when suddenly the world goes in the wrong direction or if the world goes in the right direction or whatever. You're not surprised at anything because you know the unexpected will always happen. And then when you do that, it kind of undermines our trust that we can um, uh, predict what is going to happen in the future because we cannot predict. And because we cannot predict, it makes the future less interesting. And when the future is less interesting because we, it's always going to be unexpected, uh, uh, because of that, we start grasping onto that future. We start thinking about it. Uh, we start having hopes about it. Uh, and then the meditation starts to happen instead. Uh. So it's quite powerful, yeah? And it goes against the grain of the world. Uh. Maybe some of you think that I'm going too far because this is not how people in lay life can live. Actually, you can live a little bit like this in lay life. Uh. Maybe it's difficult to take it as far as, you know, as enlightenment or whatever, but you can lean in this direction, huh? because this is just common sense when you think about it. Huh? I'm sure many of you will know that what I'm saying is true. Huh? It may be a painful truth. Huh? It may be a truth that we don't really want to hear, huh? but it's true nonetheless. Huh? This is the kind of truth that the, all the sages, all the meditation masters uh, throughout the centuries, throughout the millennia have understood. Huh? This is how they give up the world. Uh, they expect the unexpected. Uh, they know that this is the right way of thinking about life. So let us come down to the very last part here. How do you falter 
amid presently arisen phenomena. It is when an uneducated ordinary person uh, has not seen the noble ones uh, and is neither skilled nor trained in the teachings of the noble ones. Uh, they are not good persons uh, and are neither skilled nor trained in the teaching of the good persons. Uh, yeah? They regard form as self, self as having form, form in self or self in form. They regard feeling as self, feeling self as having feeling, feeling in self or self in feeling. They regard perception as self, self as having perception, perception in self or self in perception. They regard choices as self, self as having choices, choices in self or self in choices. They regard consciousness as self, self as having consciousness, consciousness in self or self in consciousness. That is how you falter amid presently arisen phenomena. So what does this mean? And this was what this lady Susie was asking before. And only now are we coming to it, always a little bit behind the time. It takes a bit of time to get to these things. And um, what this means, and this has many different levels of meaning here, but the immediate level of meaning, first of all, you will have noticed that this is about the uneducated yeah, person, the ordinary person who has not heard the teachings of the noble ones. So this would be someone who has never heard about the Buddhist teachings. Yeah, someone who is not a Buddhist has no idea about these teachings. Uh, for us, well, we are somewhere in between because we have heard a little bit of these teachings, uh, but we may not have the full understanding yet. So we're moving towards that full understanding here. So what is it that is going on here? Uh, and what is going on here is just the attachments uh, that you have right now. Uh, this is what this is referring to. Uh, it may not be obvious that it is referring to this, uh, but uh, actually it is. And it's just a very, it's a very comprehensive and detailed way of referring to the attachments in the present. Uh, yeah, so for example, you take form as self. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, well, it means that you are regarding this body as yours, uh, yeah? Or, or you have self as having form, yeah? It means that the self has the body which kind of makes sense, yeah, you, you, this body is mine, yeah, don't touch my body, keep your hands away, this is my body, don't, you can't just kill me, yeah, because if you kill me, you are destroying my body, I, w I won't have that, I don't want you to kill me, you can't just chop off my hand, yeah, because if you chop off my hand or my finger, you are ta attacking me, this is my body, this is, belongs to me, yeah? so if you feel that someone should not injure you, someone doesn't have the right to kind of hurt you or whatever, if you are attached to your body, this is what this means. You are attached to your body. And these are just different ways of thinking about that attachment, yeah? Either you identify as the body, I am the body, or you think of the body as yours, or you think of maybe the five khandhas as the as the self and the body is within the five khandhas, uh, yeah? or uh, somehow your, your self is inside the body. Maybe the idea that you have a, a soul which somehow resides within the body. Yeah? But in all of these cases, uh, form is somehow related to you and you consider it yours. Uh, and of course, many of you do that. Yeah? We, we all consider our body to be ours to some extent. It's very difficult to avoid that. Uh, yeah? and, uh, uh, but because you are a Buddhist, you have some idea that this may, maybe even though you feel like that, maybe you know also, maybe this isn't true. Yeah? Maybe this self, maybe this body is not really mine. How do you do that? How do you see that the body is not yours? And this was what the lady Susie was asking about before. Is how do you do that? Do you just think this body is not mine? Do you use this like a mantra in your meditation practice? The best way of seeing that the body is not yours yeah, is to practice meditation. Calm yourself down. Watch the breath. 
have as few defilements as possible. And as you calm down, one of the things that you will notice is that the body starts to fade away. The body starts to disappear gradually, gradually, gradually. This is called viraga in the suttas. You find this specifically in the Anapanasati Sutta, the Sutta on Mindfulness of Breathing. We'll be looking at this Sutta later on, and you will see that this is exactly what the Buddha is talking about, viraga, the fading away of form. And it fades away, there's less and less. The body disappearing in the background, maybe all you have left is the breath, yeah, everything else is gone except for the breath. There comes a point when all you have is maybe the nimitta, yeah, the kind of bright light in the mind, the beautiful mind and all of these kinds of things. And eventually the body is completely gone. And when the body is completely gone, you know for the first time that form is not self or the body is not self because it's completely gone. It's outside of your experience. You no longer have access to the body. And this is how you understand these things. So it's useful to have a preliminary understanding. Yeah, it's useful to have some idea that this is probably true. And we can probably see this at least partially in your own meditation practice. But uh, the real experience really happens in meditation. And of course, what you find is that it is delightful. Yeah, this is one of the most wonderful experiences in your life when the body is gone. You feel, wow, I had no idea the body was such a burden. I had no idea it was so heavy. I had no idea it was so problematic. But now I understand because I have extracted myself from the body completely. Now I feel much better as a consequence. Get this body is useless. Get rid of this blooming body. I don't want to have anything more to do with it. And that's kind of how you feel, yeah? And all you want to do afterwards is just meditate more and more because you understand that this body is just a heavy burden in your life. So this is the idea of uh, how you actually understand this, uh, yeah? And you understand it in a very positive way. It is not scary at all. In fact, it is incredibly attractive. You understand why these things are non-self and how these insights gradually come about as a consequence. And it is a similar story with feeling, a similar story with perception, choices, and consciousness. Yeah, all of these things we take as ourself. Yeah, I mean, we, uh, you know, you you are the chooser in your life. I am the doer. Yeah, because you are the agent and the doer, you see that as yourself. And through meditation, you start to see that the doer fading away actually is a very beautiful experience. So. This is how you see this. Uh, don't make it too theoretical. Have a basic theoretical understanding of what is happening, but uh, then really see it, understand it during your meditation practice. Uh, and then uh, you don't falter in this way. So the Buddha says, how do you not falter amid the presently arisen phenomena? It is when an educated noble disciple has seen the noble ones and is skilled and trained in the teaching of the noble ones. Yeah, in other words, you have listened to the suttas. You have listened to people who are noble. Yeah, it can be hard to know sometimes, but you have, by some accident, you have hit upon someone who really is an Arya and a noble person. Then you hear the two teachings. They have seen good persons and are skilled and trained in the teaching of the good persons. They don't regard form as self, self as having form, form in self, or self in form. They don't regard feeling as self, self as having feeling, feeling in self, or self in feeling. They don't regard perception, choices, consciousness as self, self as having consciousness, consciousness in self, self in consciousness. That is how you don't falter amid presently arisen phenomena. So that is the background. Yeah, that, that is like the theoretical side of this. And again, the way to see this, the way to make this real, the way to make this possible really only happens when it comes down to meditation practice. And it happens not through some kind of 
uh, special meditation that you need to do. It happens through the ordinary breath meditation. All you need to do is to do breath meditation to understand these kind of things. But you have to take the breath meditation to a very profound level. When you take it to a very profound level, that is when it starts to have this kind of effect. So then we have the Buddha repeating the verses. So I will repeat them as well, just following along here. So the Buddha now says, he says, don't run back to the past. Don't hope for the future. What's past is left behind. The future has not yet arrived. And phenomena in the present are clearly seen in every case. Knowing this, develop it, unfaltering, unshakable. Today is the day to keenly work. Who knows, tomorrow may bring death. For there is no bargain to be struck with death and his mighty hordes. The peaceful sage explained, it is those who keenly meditate like this, tireless all night and day, who truly have that one fine night. So uh, it's a beautiful verse, yeah? And sometimes I think on the Buddhist path, what we need to do is we need to just remember a few really inspiring things on the path, uh, a few things that just lift you up and guide you in the right direction. Uh, and sometimes just remembering even a verse like this, yeah? Memor memorizing it by heart, maybe the, even just the f first four lines, yeah, the first eight lines, something like that. Uh, if you memorize that by heart uh, and you uh, keep that in your mind, uh, then you have something that you can always bring out, yeah, to always remind you of what you should be doing, how you should be practicing here. And I know a lot of people who do that, they just remember some very simple lines of Dhamma and they use that to inspire themselves. So anyway, so coming to the very end of the sutta, and uh, that's what I meant when I said, I shall teach you a passage for recitation and the analysis of one fine night. This is what the Buddha said. Satisfied, the mendicants were happy with what the Buddha said. All right, so the mendicants, the monks were happy. I hope you are happy too. <laughs> we shall see. So let's have a five minute meditation.